I've given talks before in the past, uh, and uh, last year was sort of for me the, the year of IoT. I gave talks on uh, uh, iBeacons, and uh, actually last, the last year at uh, Forward Swift here, gave a talk on core Bluetooth. So, so I thought, what's the next most logical thing that I should do at a Swift conference? And I thought, how about React Native? Because you all love JavaScript, don't you? Um, no, but, and, and honestly, this is, there, is, uh, there is method to my madness here, uh, mostly because of, I'll, I'll kind of do a case study on myself as we talk about this, um, because I, for the last six years or so, I've been exclusively developing in iOS, Objective-C and then Swift, versions one, two, and three to some degree. Um, but then uh, last November or so, I had the opportunity to uh, begin doing uh, React Native, and honestly, I was a little scared, which you might be. So, um, it, but uh, I work for Cloud City Development here in San Francisco. Great, awesome group of people to to work with, and in fact, Andre, my colleague, is in the back. Uh, most of our our folks are uh, sort of known for their uh, Ruby skills, and uh, and I'm the sort of the, I don't know about the lone iOS developer, but, uh, but I'm the, the mobile developer uh, doing iOS for, for them. So um, we are an integrated design and software consultancy, and that's important to us because we do have the, the, the concept of uh, the design and the development uh, aspects. Um, and the other thing that I've started uh, ever since last year, I don't know if anyone's uh, heard this, but the, uh, the iOS Dev Break podcast, anyone heard of it? at least, or I've heard some, okay, I've got some hands out there, great. Excellent, uh, hope you like it. It's, it's a short, short podcast, 15 minutes or so, and uh, feel free to, to sign up. I'll have more information at the, uh, the end of the talk about that as well. Um, I don't always go into a lot of tech uh, topics, but I touch on them, and uh, most of the time I just kind of talk about whatever's going on uh, you know, with, with me in the dev development world at the, at the time. So I did want to also make a, a quick clarification here as far as the talk is concerned. What the, this talk is, is really about, it's, it's a brief overview of React Native. I'll talk about some of the good stuff, some of the bad stuff in React Native. And also, I think this is the most important one because honestly, as far as the technical things are concerned, you can get most of that just by attending workshops, uh, you can go, you know, do tutorials and that kind of read, read the documentation. But to me, th this third point is the, the why. Why would I want to do this? Why, why might I want to check this out? Or maybe not. Maybe I don't want to. It's all important to consider. Now, like I said, this talk is not a tutorial about React Native. It kind of will be, but that's not really its purpose. I'll talk, a, I'll talk about it at high level show you a little bit of code stuff, but really, to me, talking about the good things, bad things, and then that, 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 the, the reasoning at the end is the important stuff. Uh, it's not a deep dive, and it's not a motivational speech about why everyone should drop everything and switch to JavaScript and learn a totally new development par paradigm for creating mobile applications. That's not what this is about. <laughs> However, uh, there will be a little ironic snippet a little later, but, um, and then as a reminder, I'm an iOS, Swift, Objective-C, uh, history kind of, you know, developer. So, and as I mentioned before, I have this iOS development podcast. So that's, that's where I, I live, where I like to live. So you can think about that for a second and, and realize where I'm coming from. But seriously, what is it? What is React Native? Why is it important? Um, what is this React Native thing I keep hearing about or you keep hearing about? How many of us, first of all, have heard of React Native? Good. How many of you have tried it out a bit? Okay, fewer hands. How many of, I know, I, I, I can, we're gonna keep going here. How many have done at least one project in it? Okay, a few more, okay, or a few less. Uh, and who, who of you are doing this day in, day out? Okay, excellent. So you and I are the only ones who are doing this day in and day out. And you've probably, have you, how long have you been doing it? Four months. Four months. Oh, so we're about the same. You probably know more than I do, though. <laughs> so we'll ask you to come up and finish the, 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 no, it's gone. 
It's all right. I really enjoyed your, your talk earlier, by the way. Um, so what, what React Native is, it is, and this is the ironic part, is it is a JavaScript-based development framework for creating mobile applications. That, in a nutshell, is what React Native is all about. Um, and if you are a web developer, this is awesome, right? Or if you've been developing uh, back-end stuff, doing Node.js, this is a win for you. But for the rest of us, if we, have been, if we spent our lives doing Objective-C, Swift, this can be a little scary, especially, like for me, uh, this is, I'll just be honest here. Uh, so in my case, the last time I had done any serious JavaScript was around 2010-ish. So we're talking six years, give or take. Of, of actually doing some, some real JavaScript. You know, all, you always have to do a little bit here and there, but, but nothing really serious. So for me, it was kind of like, whoa. And then th uh, add in things like ES6. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Like, what is that, you know? So anyway, it's, uh, it's good, good questions. And uh, one thing to remember, too, is that React Native, what it isn't, it is not a hybrid app running inside a web view. So that's great. Because so many times we've heard of like PhoneGap, you know, Essentia, what, these, these other solutions down through the years, and you've seen them come, you've seen them go, that's not what this is. It is not that. And that's important to know because it affects uh, performance issues and so forth. It's also, this is a really, really key concept that it is not necessarily, is not always a wrapper around native components or native controls, like uh, UI button and those kinds of things. It doesn't do that. There are certain, certain uh, controls in the, in the framework, in, in UI kit, that it will wrap around if you ask it to. But in the main, you don't want it to do that because of the other benefit that this gives you that we'll talk about in a little bit. So, and as a side note, this was a really big confusion point for me, and actually it was Paul Hudson's excellent workshop last year that thankfully Forward, uh, Forward Swift offered uh, a little um, trial run of, to be able to see the workshops from last year on the videos, and so that came in great help. Uh, and uh, Paul gave this really, really excellent um, uh, description that it's really, it's a native rendering is what they're doing. So they've figured out a way to render these things. They're not actually using the native components that we're used to, but they kind of wrap them in what names and things that we, we could expect uh, to, for them to be. So hopefully that helps you a little bit and doesn't confuse too much. You can use ES6, which for many of us is like, what? Basically, ES6 is a, you know, it's a, it's a nicer, more modern version of JavaScript that, that, than we may have been used to in the past. And there's also an ES7 too coming along. Uh, there we go. So like an example is a thing about async a await. And if you're a big time JavaScript-y kind of person, this would be a, this would be a really nice thing to, to know. That's an ES7 feature. Um, ES6 is kind of cool because it, it feels to me a little more Swifty than prior versions. Um, and it, what, this, is, this is what I thought was funny is that there's this, this concept of, uh, you know, in prior versions of JavaScript, it was pretty much var, you would declare a variable, and then, uh, but now you can do constants using the const, and they use let. But guess what? Let is variable. <laughs> so coming from Swift, you're like, I can't win. So, so I'm constantly, you know, it's, it let, wait, do I want let? Or, oh, I can const. That's right. Okay, so, so once you once you're in it for a while, it doesn't make it's not a problem unless you go back to Swift. <laughs> so anyway, so that's that's usually you know my reaction there. Uh, the other neat thing, um, it, it's kind of one of these things that I, was, I had mixed emotions about uh, was that uh, it had it uses a JavaScript XML notation right within the JavaScript. So. Um, you know, we may be used to, let's say, like a storyboard or something where our, our, um, uh, the declarative form of our UI is elsewhere, right? And then we have our, um, the implementation details of all the, all the, the Swift code is in the, the Swift file. So um, th this actually allows you to, to mix, intermingle this XML, we'll show, you, show it to you in a little bit here, uh, with your JavaScript. 
And um, it actually is kind of, it's an interesting way of doing this. And I've found that it really, really speeds things up for me. And uh, this is an example here. And this is when I want to walk over there. But um, so this is just a snippet. You can imagine that this would actually be within a larger block of JavaScript, okay? But uh, basically it has things like this view thing. What's that? Well, um, it's kind of like maybe like a, a, a UI view kind of deal. It's basically a container structure. Uh, if you come from the web side of things, that would be equivalent to like a div. So, um, and then uh, there's text, which is, I, I like to think of that as kind of like being like a UI label. label. Uh, text input, you know, so uh, UI text field. Um, and, uh, and then you can do all these JavaScript-y kind of events, event handling, which at first might feel a little strange, but after a while you get kind of used to it, and it's, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, uh, the other thing that React Native has this obsession about is state. So you're constantly, you can manipulate your state uh, within a component, and you'll probably want to just, like, if, you're, if this interests you, Read up on it later. Um, so, but then the other thing that you don't change in general, uh, or that you don't change, is are these things called props. So those are the properties that you see. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, actually, all of the properties that are like in text input, these the, these values here, those you don't really change once you're inside the component. And uh, if that confuses you, my apologies. Um, and, but to learn more about this, you can go to their, uh, about the JavaScript environment if you're interested in that kind of thing. This is the React Native stuff. It tells you what parts of JavaScript are valid in React Native. The ES6 stuff, the ES7 stuff, blah, blah, blah. So um, the other neat thing too, and I'll show you this as well, is that it uses a JavaScript uh, form of CSS. And it also uses the concept of a flex, a flex box. Which, to me, coming from iOS, I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't know what that is. That sounds kind of scary. I mean, I, I've done CSS in the past, and, uh, but what's this Flexbox thing? Um, turns out, you can sort of think of, of Flexbox as kind of like auto layout that does a lot of that work for you. So in many ways, it, it really is great for rapidly building out UIs. It, it's actually, it's, it's amazing, you know. Um, would I, I don't know. We'll, we'll get to the other, the other, the follow-up question in, in a bit here. I'll, I'll hold back on this. So um, the next section of this is what I call the good, the bad, and the amazing uh, things of React Native. This is, these are the things that I found, like, uh, like I said, I've only been doing this four months or so. But uh, first, let's talk about the good stuff. The first thing is that it works. It actually is kind of, uh, it's, it's an amazing that this concept, that, that Facebook has developed this and it works as well as it does. Um, and this cross-platform thing, to me, this is probably one of the, the biggest deals is the cross-platform um, support. And when I say cross-platform, I basically mean iOS and Android. Uh, you can also do, it turns out they have, if you create out a, um, a standard project, it'll do uh, tvOS too. Um, and so the, the good also, JavaScript, if, you, if you're into JavaScript, I actually kind of liked it before doing Objective-C and Swift, so to me, coming back to JavaScript was kind of nice. It's a very dynamic and kind of fun language to work with, in my opinion. Uh, it's not everyone's opinion. Uh, and also, I'll show you this in a little bit, uh, debugging it with Chrome. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yes. So we'll show you this in just a little bit here. You can debug using Chrome. It launches another tab in Chrome while you're running the app in the iOS simulator. So I'll show you this in a bit. And it gets better. There's one, there's one more thing that's even better than that. Um, and then I mentioned about the CSS. That's kind of one of the good things because especially if you've done web development in the, back, in the past, being able to transfer those kind of concepts, it doesn't feel too foreign. Uh, components, uh, this is the other kind of, I don't know if it's an obsession that React Native has and React in some way. They're very much about building out components, breaking out pieces of your app into smaller components that can then be used 
uh, reused, uh, you know, de decomposing stuff. It's, it's actually a very nice model, and it's really easy to do. And it mostly consists of kind of boilerplate -y kind of stuff, like, oh, I'm going to create a new, com new component, fill in some things, plug it in, and you're good to go. Uh, also, they have some interesting kinds of built-in components. Now, this one, I see a smile, and that's because... <laughs> she knows about this one. Um, keyword avoiding a view. How many of us have had to build out that irritating code that if you have like a table view or something and you have and the keyboard comes up and then you have to monkey around with trying to move your components all around? How many of us have had to do that like on every app? Yeah, and I keep thinking, Xcode 8 and we still don't have this yet? Come on. Anyway, so what's neat about this is that uh, in, in very simple cases, keyboard avoiding, avoiding view will actually do this for you. You tell everything to go into a keyboard avo avoiding view, like you can put a, a text field, put the label, uh, and some other stuff, and then uh, when the keyword is invoked, it automatically scrolls it for you into view, which is kind of neat. There are caveats, and like I said, under simple cases, this is great. There are times when this will make you nuts and you, you'll, you'll run screaming from your computer and yeah. So uh, in those cases, uh, in fact, I had this recently and I had to roll my own. So I just went ahead and used a basic a scroll view and it turns out it actually uh, was easier, I thought, to do it in, uh, by myself manually in uh, React Native than in uh, iOS. Um, so this is back to build your own components. Uh, if I get a chance, I'll show you this. In fact, oh, I have a little example here. That's right. So notice here I have this sort of blob of XML here. What I want you to focus in on is this part here. So what I'm doing is uh, React Native actually, uh, similarly to iOS, it provides a, an activity indicator built in. Um, but we really wanted to be able to have a reusable component that, that not only had the activity indicator, but also had a little label underneath. So what I wanted to do, uh, so what we were able to do was to go ahead and extract that thing and, uh, and turn it into a loading indicator that is, that is ours. This is our loading indicator, and it has a message that, that you can have. In, and it's optionally set here. Uh, the message is not set here because I, I let it be uh, optional, which gets us to prop types. This is something you, you don't need to remember this, but it's kind of a neat feature of React Native in that those props that you see, when you're building out your own components, you can say, okay, I want this particular, let's say it's called message is the, the name of the property that you want to be able to set. You can say that it's required and that it needs to be a string. Um, so it's kind of nice. And then it will actually tell you when you're at runtime whether or not that has been set or not. Um, good, so this is kind of an example of how, how to do that. Uh, so, for example, button text there, prop types dot string. Since it doesn't say is required on the end, it's it's an optional thing. Um, okay. Oh, and this is the implementation of that. So this is this is the the prop types. This would be sitting inside the component. And then when you actually uh, put that add button, this is a different component, uh, actually into uh, the, uh, the the layout of perhaps a view of some sort. Um, think of it like maybe a view controller. Um, then you, this particular button, you, then you can set the style, the button text, and then uh, set the, you know, the, uh, the event handler. Okay, so now we get to the bad. <laughs> this is the fun one. Um, one of the, this is one of the more frustrating things about React Native is the fact that there are, because it is cross-platform, and honestly, this was not a surprise to me. Uh, I expected more of these. I actually expected this to be really, really awful, but it turns out it's not so, so bad, but it is kind of bad. That there are cross-platform oddities and, uh, and irritations between the two platforms, like fonts, for instance. The way Android handles fonts, it wants them in specific naming conventions iOS is much, it, when you do it in iOS, it's pretty much the same way that we're used to. You add them to your bundle and you, know, you set your info P list and, and you tell it which, which fonts are there, that's okay. You know? But then Android, it has some, some, uh, some kind of nicer handlings, but then once you go to actually access, uh, access the, and use the fonts, if they're not named the same, then it's just a big headache. So fonts are kind of a, a pain, and you may have to monkey around with that a little bit. The other one, too, is the, the picker, so like the UI picker. Uh, 
Does anyone here is anyone here a you an Android user? Or you've used an Android before, and you've you've seen the the picker that is very different, right, from from what iOS iOS has that thing that comes up on the bottom that you can you know spin right, and then Android actually has this thing that pops up in your whole view and it presents those options right in the middle of the 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 screen, and it's like whoa. So because of those cross platform differences, it can be a little bit of a shock and a, a real pain to try to style and handle. So. Uh, this is the other thing which for me personally, every time I have to get into Android, uh, um, yeah, enough said. And I can't seem to actually get to my um, the code example there. But w what is kind of neat is that uh, when you build out your React Native project, it actually, uh, inside the, the folder, you have all this JavaScripty stuff. And then you have one folder called iOS, and then another fol folder called Android. And everything that you need for both platforms is actually contained right within those, within those folders, uh, so in those directories, so it's kind of nice. Um, let's see. I'm not quite sure why optional JavaScript was there. But anyway, uh, so the other kind of downside is the, the documentation. Uh, one thing you, you should know, and this this I would actually, I Yes, this, this goes right into this. The pace of the React Native releases, it used to be relentless. Like every two weeks you would get a new version. Imagine if we had <laughs> new versions of Swift like every two weeks and it broke stuff. <laughs> every time. And you're like, ah. So um, thankfully, there's two good things. First of all, there are not as many uh, breaking changes now. Um, and they've also slowed down the pace a little bit. So now, instead of every two weeks, it's every month. Every, every month you get to break stuff. Um, but it is getting better. It is, it is getting better. Now, I'd, I would like to talk about the awesome. I think I've touched on some of these things. And uh, this, 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 this like actually kind of blew my mind. Um, has anyone used Fetch like in Node.js or anything before? Uh, okay. All right, so we have, we have some. Um, or in other, other JavaScript contexts. OK, so <laughs> when we, in, in iOS, you know, typically we work with things like NSURL session, or you have other things, or maybe we're using Alamo Fire or AF networking, or, you know, there's all of these things that we have to do. So React Native uh, bundles in a, a library called uh, Fetch, it's the Fetch API. And uh, it's a Mozilla thing. And it's actually quite amazing the fact that you can just say, fetch, you can actually just tell it. Go to this URL, and then in a, what amounts to like a completion handler, you can think of it, that's how I kind of think of it. I often find myself translating the, the, uh, the JavaScripty things uh, into uh, either Objective-C or Swift, uh, depending on my, the way my brain's going. So anyway, so there's, there's our fetch dog. I'll show you an example of that because, uh, oh, here's the example, cool. So notice that you, I have this, this is the full method for getting information from, uh, getting data from a server that is running locally on my machine. I have this URL, this localhost 3000 messages. I say just fetch URL method get. And then it has a response, which I handle, and then I turn it into JSON, and then that's it. <laughs> I mean, then, then, as I mentioned about the state, you can see like right about a third of the way down, it says this dot state, or set state. Then you uh, hand this, this your, your JSON, you clone it, uh, and hand it to your, your data source, and that's basically it. Half of this is actually alert. <laughs> See <laughs> at the bottom, the, the 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 bottom half of all that code is console log and a, and an alert there, you know. And and to me, when I saw that, I was like, oh, that that is awesome. That's really really cool. And um, I think as Paul Hudson mentions in his workshop, if you if you if you decide to use the ES7 features of async, oh wait, it gets even nicer. But I like this. This is great. I, I'm happy with this. Uh, so that that highlights basically it's just that top part that's really the the important stuff. Okay, the other thing is JSON. How many of us have used JSON before? All hands go up. Yes, 
And we all have to, what do we have to do in Swift or Objective-C beforehand? What do we, we typically have to use our JSON serializer, right? We're, we're, we're taking it from JSON and giving it, putting it into something that we can use within Swift, within Objective-C or whatever. But here's, this is, this is one of those aha things that, that, uh, that I had that was, that kind of blew me away. And it didn't, it didn't click initially, which is that the data comes in, I'm using JavaScript. I'm using JavaScript. The data that comes in is JavaScript. I don't have to do anything with it. I don't have to parse it. I don't have to, it's just, it is what it is. So to imagine just taking something and saying, okay, well, maybe I have this collection of messages and it comes back, it's an array of messages and, and maybe the message has a, uh, a text property and a name property. All I have to do is just take the array and grab the, grab the items out of the array and take the, the, the text and the name properties. I don't have to do anything with it. So to me, that was another big win, uh, especially since typically our, uh, our, uh, our servers that, we're, that are, we're using for our APIs, they're usually returning JSON. And so no parsing necessary. It is the thing you want already. Now, there is one exception, of course, is if you get, maybe you're, you're, you have an API that just gives you massive globs of stuff, and maybe it's, it's an API that you don't have control over, and it's giving you big, you know, objects back, maybe you want to go ahead and actually parse out the, the pertinent data, you would have to do that, of course. The other awesome thing is Flexbox. I mentioned this earlier. If this interests you, I highly recommend you take a look at the documentation um, on, on React Native. It has some um, really interesting examples there. The other thing, we are totally not going to get into this, is this thing called Redux. Um, this is something that, that uh, I think is awesome, but it's also mind-bendingly complex. But it, is, it has a steep learning curve when React Native already does. Um, but it is pretty awesome. And uh, the other thing, too, is that you can refresh your simulator using Command R. If you have an Android simulator running at the same time, you, you can hit R twice, tuk -tuk, and it refreshes your app immediately, no rebuilding necessary. And you can also put it into a mode where it automatically refreshes when you make a code change, which is it blew me away. Uh, okay, the other thing too is when you're in the documents, uh, documentation up on, on uh, Facebook's documents, documentation, excuse me, uh, they have this feature where you can actually run the example of the document, I mean, of the, the documentation that you're looking at. Like if, you, if there's a component you're interested in, very often they'll have an example off to the side. You can just run it there. It runs in this sort of mock iOS simulator and you can test it all there. So the elephant in the room, of course, is what I mentioned earlier, which is, Gerald, uh, why would we do this? And uh, why should I care? Who is this for and should I use it? And this is kind of what it boils down to is, I think this, it really is a business decision. It's your business decision whether or not you wanna go with this or not. Because there's some questions that come up. Who are your users? What are they using? Are they using iOS? Are they using Android? Are they using both? Um, Maybe, how many are, of you are either consultants or work for a company that is a consultancy? Okay, so we got some, we got some here. So you may have clients who need an Android version. Are you gonna go find an Android developer? Or maybe might this work for you as an option? Um, the other thing too is that I, I tend to think that the, the React Native use case is like, you don't use React Native to build amazing, engaging experiences. You probably can if you work at it. Um, it does support some animation and that kind of thing. But to me, I mean, this is one, one thing, um, Janie Clayton gave a talk last year at Forward Swift and she said, she said, I don't want to spend the rest of my life populating uh, table views. You know, and which is, which is funny when she said it because I thought, you know, she's right. Like 90% of our apps that we see, you know, you think of Twitter, Facebook, all those things. It's basically populating table views, tap something, it's a detail view, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Even within iOS proper. So, but for those kinds of apps, React Native is great for, for that kind of thing. Uh, and so are, there, are they iOS users? Are they Android users? And also tvOS is in there too. So, but the other thing too is about if you have clients, who are their customers? What are they using? What are their needs? So uh, to learn more, we had some, I'd say go to the uh, React Native docs, 
Paul Hudson has the, the Going Native with uh, React from the Forward Courses. Uh, I believe, is there still the, the, thir the little trial? Awesome, so you can do the trial uh, at Forward Courses, and I'm, I'm assuming that Tim Garcia's talk, or workshop, uh, this week from React Native uh, will be up there too, so you can learn a whole lot more. It's uh, really good stuff. So that's me, I'm Evan, Evan Stone, uh, with Cloud City Development. You can catch me on Interactive Logic. I'm actually, that's wrong. It's now Evan K. Stone. I was able to change it. So in, ignore that Twitter handle there. It's Evan K. Stone is my, my uh, personal one. Um, there's also an iOS dev break Twitter handle too. Um, and feel free to subscribe at iTunes or, or on Overcast. You can do that for the, the podcast. And uh, you can go to iOSdevbreak.com if you have more information too. Um, yeah, so I guess that, that's probably all we have time for. That's right. Thanks, Evan. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat>